good morning. I think everybody can hear me. That's okay. All right. Um, let me just get the Bible app pulled up here. All right. So as we begin to share today, as mentioned, uh, Carol and I, uh, as many of you know us, we spent a few years here prior to heading to a place called Saipan. We'll get into some of that later. Uh, what I do want to share with you a little bit today is this passage of Scripture in the Old Testament. And that's going to come out of Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with this passage. Ezekiel is in the wilderness, and as we find him, he has this very interesting conversation with God about something that I'd always considered was for people that were lost, but really this passage is actually to people that are his people or God's people. And so as we begin to look at this, let's go ahead and have a short time of prayer together. Oh, Father God, we're thankful for the opportunity, Lord, today to share in your place, Father, hopefully these words empower us, strengthen us, God, and lead us into a closer walk with you. Father, also as we uh, get to share a little bit later, Father, about our journey, God, that it might impress upon others, Father, that we all have a specific calling to answer. God, that we all have a specific role to fill in your church, Father, in your ministry. And Father, that all of our efforts are for your purposes. God, we love you today, Father. We give you great praise. Father, help us today understand what it is you need us to get out of this message, Father, out of this passage, and how we share that with other people. And Lord, also what we can do locally, regionally, and around the world to impact people with the gospel. Father, we are so thankful for your Holy Spirit leading us to this place today. It's not by occurrence that we are all here, but Father, but by uh, your mighty hand leading us here. In the precious name of Jesus, Father, we pray and we ask as we begin our time together. Amen. And so as mentioned, we're going to look at, uh, for a little bit of time, Ezekiel 37. And so I do want to read uh, this beginning part with you. And so I'm using uh, the Good News Translation, so it might uh, be a little bit different, uh, but all very similar. So this is what it says in verse 1. It says, I felt the powerful presence of the Lord, and a spirit took me and set me down in a valley where the ground was covered with bones. And he led me all around the valley, and I could see that there were very many bones, and they were very dry. He said to me, mortal man, can these bones come back to life? And I replied, sovereign Lord, only you can answer that. And he said, prophesy to the bones. Tell these dry bones to listen to the word of the Lord. Tell them that I, the sovereign Lord, am saying to them, I'm going to put breath into you and bring you back to life. And I will give you some news and muscles and cover you with skin. And I will put breath into you and bring you back to life. Then you will know that I'm the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been told. And while I was speaking, I heard a rattling noise. And the bones began to join together. And while I watched, the bones recover with sinews and with muscles and then with skin. But there was no breath in the bodies. And God said to me, mortal man, prophesy to the wind. And tell the wind that the Sovereign Lord commands it to come from every direction to breathe into these bodies and to bring them back to life. So I prophesied as I had been told and breath into the bodies and they came to life and stood up. And there were enough of them to form an army. And God said to me, mortal man, the people of Israel are like these bones. They say that they are dried up without any hope and with no future. So prophesy to my people of Israel and tell them that I, the Sovereign Lord, and going to open their graves, and I'm going to take them out and bring them back to the land of Israel. And when I open the graves where my people are buried and bring them out, they will know that I am the Lord. And I'll put my breath into them and bring them back to life and let them live in their own land. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And I have promised that I will do this, and I will. I, the Lord, have spoken. And so we finish that beginning part of 37 and I think it has a lot of value uh, to what Carol and I will share later, but also just simply a lot of value uh, to us as a people that are supposed to be responding to God's active calling or God's active desires in our lives. So I'm reminded of a passage in 1 Peter, and Peter would say basically that we should be understanding about the calling God has placed in our life. But we should be responsive to it, even to the point that we, that we take the calling and we take it seriously enough 
to make it something, as Peter would say, is something that is past the day. It's not just temporary. It's not just something that is going to happen for a season of life, but for something that is going to be a continual process within us. So you may ask and say, Justin, when we saw you a few years ago, you were not an international missionary. What, what happened? First, I would say that God's word living through us and in us can be and is transformative. It's not something that is temporary. It's not something that will last for a bit of time and then go away. It actually is continual. Okay, it's a continual process with his people. But as I mentioned, Peter would write this something we have to commit to daily. Apostle Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians would even say that we should be renewed daily by our minds. We should reset and refocus on God's desires in our life and also what we're supposed to be doing for him on a daily basis. Not just thinking about it on occasion, but daily. Continually recommitting ourselves back to God's mission and what it is he desires for us. And so as I share a little bit more in a few minutes I think it's very interesting of how this beginning part goes with Ezekiel and God. And as they meet, there's this area, as we said, the valley of the dry bones. It's just this area where death seems to happen. Now, I'm, I'm not sure how much all of you know about uh, Jewish uh, tradition and, and Jewish law, but dry bones, uh, cemeteries, that was not a place that Jewish people would ever be found hanging out. Uh, it was even detestable to them, right? And so when Jesus would call the, the Pharisees in the New Testament, when he would say that their insides are like cemeteries or graveyards, that was very offensive to them. They, they, they thought that was detestable. They didn't go near it. They would never hang out anywhere near that place. That's why even as we find uh, Jesus going to uh, the gatherings and he would find a man uh, that is tormented by many spirits and in a graveyard, nobody else was going to go help him because it was detestable to even be there, much less to approach a man that was living among the graves. And so Jesus set this precedence up that he was willing to be different than all the other teachers, than all of the other men of the law, than all of the other people in the Old Testament that would prophesy even greater than some of the great kings that we read about. So Jesus will be different. And so you're saying, well, how is he different? How did he become different? I think it comes back to that word. He became transformative. It wasn't just something he wanted you to do differently for a season. He wanted you to consider your life. But then what are you going to do about it continually? See, when Jesus approaches not just the Pharisees, but the Jewish people, he would tell them things that would change the way they thought about everything. <laughs> he, would, he would do things that nobody else would do, and then they would scratch their heads. And then they would try to get Jesus to say something they thought was wrong. And we see this play out through all of the gospel accounts. Ultimately, when they couldn't find any wrong deed in Jesus, they would convince the people, crucify. They would convince the Jews to say, this man is evil or something's wrong with him. So today, my friends, you can choose one of two things, okay? You can either choose that Jesus was a crazy person, that he was a raging lunatic. You can, you can choose that if you want. To the many Jewish people, he seemed very heretical. He seemed crazy. He didn't have the set of standards they were used to, so you can still choose that today if you want. Or the other option, the other option is this. Jesus was who he said he was. So he was, he was crazy, he was insane, or he, he is and was who he said he was. So today, my friends, I, I want to encourage you to consider that all of these writers of the New Testament would not have given their lives, and some of them dying for the cause of Christ, had they not believed Jesus was who he said he was and his power 
came from on high and was a real occurrence. They would not have done any of this stuff. They would simply have walked away. When we read about in Acts 1 where Jesus ascends uh, into heaven after he has risen from the dead and after he's shown himself uh, to many people, not just the disciples, and he finally meets with his disciples for the last time and he ascends back to heaven, I, I think this is a very interesting, uh, crucial point in our history of Christianity is all of these people that were gathered in the upper room. They could have just realized Jesus just left. What do I do now? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a Messiah now. I'm not some Savior now. What, what do I do now? But yet, instead, instead of them abandoning and running from the, the cause of Christ, we find that they would stand firm. They would wait on the gift of the Holy Spirit that would happen in Acts chapter 2. And then they would begin to continue giving their lives for the sake of the gospel. And we would see, even on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, uh, that 3,000 people would accept Jesus in one day. And then the account tells us at the end of Acts 2, they would continue to add to their number daily those who were being saved. And so we would go from that point, and you would say, how does something that was not around, that was not prevalent in the world of that time, how did it have any type of root? How did it continue from a small group of people that were fearing for their lives to something that even if people don't believe today, they know that Jesus at least, at least was a holy man, at least <laughs> has some type of footing in the real world. If nothing else, at least people know that. So how did it go from that to where we are today? How, how did it happen? And so once again, the primary thing that continued throughout the gospel accounts continued in the book of Acts, continued in the letters that finish out in the New Testament, is that they were committed to the gospel and they did everything they could to spread it daily, every single day. They had no reserve. They held nothing back. Oftentimes I consider uh, the American church at large, at large, with so many means and so many opportunities and so many able bodies. And yet, my friends, this is a sad reality that so many of our churches are without pastors. So many of our churches are closing, <laughs> even in our own denomination. You can print off a list or look online just of the churches that are listed on General Baptist uh, website, and you'll find six or seven pages Oh, churches that need pastors have vacancies. And those are just the ones that contacted headquarters. Those aren't everybody. Probably a small fraction of the amount of people that need pastors or church leaders. And that's just the beginning. Past that, then you're like, how about the churches that have leaders and then they're, they're decreasing or they're about to close? My friends, I think a lot of it really goes back to this idea of commitment. This idea of calling. And it's not just an idea. I think sometimes we, we consider it like that. We're like, well, uh, we, can, we can think about all these great things, and we'll put them over here for a season or for a time, and then maybe we'll revisit them, and then maybe we'll pray about them, and we'll think about it, and then maybe we won't, <laughs> and then maybe we'll stay over there. And then before long, we find out that we do a lot of our priorities that way, even our church priorities. And the things is a large group of believers, we begin to just toss them over in right field. And we're like, well, maybe we'll get to that. And then what was that? And the next business meeting or the next time you come together, what was that thing that we threw up there? Let us be daily on task for God's kingdom. On a daily, daily. Not just on occasion. Not just when you come for community worship. Not just when you have special events. But let Jesus permeate every section of your life continually. As I mentioned earlier, Peter would say that it has to be that way, or your calling is never going to be effective. It's never going to be full. And so today you're like, well, I, I'm not called to be a missionary. I know that. Okay, then I would encourage you to seek and find out what it is God is calling you to at this exact moment in your life. There's something. I, I can encourage you that. Absolutely something. After you've accepted Jesus, 
And maybe you're here today and you haven't accepted Jesus. We're going to get there in a moment. But if you've accepted Jesus today as Lord of, of your life, as a King of kings of your life, as director of your life, consider what it is he is calling you to and how you achieve that. How do you get there? Well, you're saying, I believe God is trying to lead me uh, to work with the kids. And you're like, maybe I've been thinking that for the last two years. <laughs> or maybe I've been thinking about it for the last ten years. And then I would ask you, have you done anything with that? Right. And then many people would say, no. They would say, no like that. No. There are a lot of, and this is maybe very bold, but there are a lot of people that die and spend eternity apart from God because there are people around them that continue to say no. <laughs> they continue to say, I'll get to that later, or I'll do it sometime, or when the time occurs that it seems perfect, when the stars are aligning just right, I'll get to it. Be absolutely affirmed today, hell's full of people that could have been reached by other people that simply continue to say no. So today, my friends, let us be people of action and say, yeah, God, I'll do that. And I'm not even sure how to do it yet, but I'll do it. I'll, I'll figure it out. So as I mentioned, this is just an illustration because kids ministry is always important everywhere. And sometimes there's the biggest gap in a lot of churches. Let's just be real about that. And so let's say that you're like, hey, I want to work with kids. Go find them, the director of your kids ministry and say, I want to help. That's it. Start with that. I promise you they're going to put you to work. Why? Because kids ministry needs help. I, that's why I use that, that illustration. Maybe it's another calling. And, and my friends, let's not rank our callings and say, well, kids ministry is down here and senior pastoral ministry is up here and worship ministry is somewhere. Man, don't, don't do that. The rest of your life is already categorized. Don't do that to God's calling on your life. If God has called you to work with the kids, then make that a priority and don't consider it less than something else. Or if God has called you uh, to be part of the outreach team of your church, don't consider that less than something else. But put your commitment or your internal decision into action. See, as Carolyn and I would leave um, here around what, July of 2019, uh, we began to head into this place called Saipan. Not really knowing much about it, aside from an email that had a lot of long stuff about it. Not really understanding what kind of commitment it was fully. Not really having a whole lot of answers. Many of you may remember that you asked us a lot of questions before we left, and I didn't have a whole lot of answers simply because I didn't know. So what we get there, and this is not really part of a presentation, it's something I want to share with you briefly. So we begin to get there, and as we are sitting in the Tokyo airport, and we're almost there. And Carolyn, I can't remember the way she said it, maybe she'll tell you later. But she told me that finally she felt at peace with where we were doing. I was like, well, that's a good thing, because we're already almost here, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a good thing. But it wasn't just a superficial, I feel okay. It was, yeah, I'm, I'm at peace about where we're at, okay? And so, and my friends, maybe you've never experienced that. I, I hope you haven't, but maybe, maybe you haven't. And so, so I would encourage you, if you haven't found that place where you said, God, I'm at peace with where I'm at and where you placed me and with the calling you've given me. I hope you're there, but if you're not, then I hope and I pray that you would find that place, that you would commit to your local church, that you would commit to serving here. You would commit to serving those around you and your community. You would make it an important priority on that list. And my friends, I understand I understand that list that just, <laughs> it just goes on and on and on and on, right? You could write a whole book about priorities and things you got to do and tasks, right? But let's not put off serving God until tasks 1 through 15 are done. Let's not put off serving God until, you know, my five-year plan works out. If you've accepted Jesus today, I hope you have, and if not, 
We're going to get there in just a second. I know I said that a few minutes ago. Pastors are always like that. But if you accepted Jesus today, if you've already done that, if you've made the commitment, put Jesus at the top, okay? Put him at the top of this list. Make that a priority to serve him daily in the best way you can. And then let the rest of the task play out from there. And he said, so I should put Jesus before I put my relationship with my wife? Yeah. And you're like, whoa, I never heard that before. I hope you have. I put Jesus before a relationship with my children. I love my eight-year-old, my three-year-old. Yeah. I put Jesus before my comfortability, before my predetermined outcome in life. Yes. I put Jesus before that huge monumental list of stuff I got to do. Yes. And don't hesitate. (laughs) Don't hesitate. We would begin to hesitate about our priority with God in the center and there's other stuff after it. If we begin to hesitate, what happens is Jesus slips down that list a few spots. And then eventually, maybe he ends up over there in right field like we talked about a few minutes ago. And then maybe eventually you don't even know what a church is because you haven't been in a year. It's a very quick slide. So prioritize your relationship with Jesus and let everything else stem from that. And so now you said... Uh, Pastor, you said, if I'm not saved, then what does this message have anything for me? I'm glad you asked that. See, our lives are not just for us to become an adult, pay bills, and die. Many people do that. That's a pretty dismal, uh, that's a pretty dismal outcome in life. Many people do that. See, the gospel was not designed for you to have a quick encounter with God and then to leave the church and become the same person you entered as. That's that's not it. If you've had that experience, it was not transformative. It wasn't real. It wasn't a serious dedication to Jesus. So if you're here lost today, if you don't know Jesus today, I would encourage you. In in a little while, we have a, a song to come up, but past that, don't just make it an open act. Many people can do and show a lot of things. But today, consider, uh, if you have a vacancy in your soul, and I believe all people do before they accept Jesus, there's something you're trying to fill that hole with, that vacancy with, and it can be a slew of all kinds of stuff. Maybe it's a lot of things at the same time. I would encourage you to think about and consider, what can Jesus do for me today? Well, first off, he's not going to leave you the same way he found you. That's the first thing. And so maybe all the other relationships in your life are like that. Maybe you've had a lot of experience with that. Maybe all your boss does when you go to work is make fun of you and push you down. You probably experienced that. I don't have, right? Maybe you experience negative relationships in your families. And you're like, oh, Jesus isn't like that. <laughs> but I can encourage you, Jesus is different. And he's different because he's not the same as the world. As I mentioned earlier, he was not the same in so much of a matter that the Jews would eventually hate him because he wasn't the same. He did not fit their mold. He didn't come back to take Israel out of control of the Romans. He didn't do what they wanted him to do. He was vastly different. So vastly different they eventually killed him. So vastly different that the Jews that a week before would cry, Hosanna, welcome in the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, that a week later, not even, they would say crucify, they would say, hey, kill this guy, huh? We've had enough of Jesus. So today, my friends, if you are seeking, if you're, if you're looking, you're like, man, I, I can't seem to fill that hole. I've got it. It's there. I don't know how to finish it. I don't know how to take care of it. I've tried everything. I've tried self-help. I've tried do-it-yourself projects to try to get stuff done in my life. Man, it hasn't cut it yet. I've tried meaningful relationship. It hasn't cut it yet. Consider today in just a few moments of turning those things over to God. Consider today for a moment that maybe the problems that are surmounting that you can't seem to get past, that maybe there's a Savior that can take care of that stuff. They can erase it. They can destroy it. And he said, it's not possible. I've got a long list of stuff. And before Jesus, we all had a long list of stuff. I think this is a unifying thing. This is my last statement before we have a song. 
sin in that word is so... Uh, it's not used in our culture <laughs> well. But the word sin is simply that you have become estranged from God or you're distanced from God by action. Okay. Uh, the Bible would even tell us that sin is created by an inward desire to do something outside of God's will. That it's actually our fault that we decide to do something and then we make a commitment to it and therefore sin is created. That's what the Bible teaches us. So maybe you're like, hey, I've done a lot of sin. I've had a lot of things that are outside of God's will. Can he forgive me of that stuff? Absolutely. And maybe today you're like, Man, I, but you don't understand. I've done a lot of really, really bad things. And Justin's done a lot of really bad things that I'm not going to tell you about up here. So in some way, we're all in the same boat. The scripture would even tell us in the book of Romans that all of sin and come short of God's glory. Yeah, we're all in the same boat. At some point, we either had to accept Jesus or we still have to accept Jesus. That's it. Scripture would go on, and it would say that the only way to access heaven, this beautiful place that lasts for eternity with God, that by no other name aside from Jesus can we enter heaven. It's a pretty powerful statement. It's a pretty meaningful statement. Scripture would go on from there, and it would say something like this, that at the end of your time here, your spirit will... Stand testimony to God. If you've accepted Jesus, then you'll hear something like, come in, my good and faithful servant. If you've not accepted Jesus, if you've rejected him continually, and in America we hear about Jesus a lot, so if you don't accept Jesus, typically it's because you've rejected him. Typically. You'll hear something like, Depart from me, I never knew you. Leave my face. <laughs> you get out of here. So today, my friends, as we have a song, if we can have, please come up at this time, uh, just consider for a moment before Carolyn comes up in just a few minutes and we kind of finish out our time, consider that relationship with Jesus today. So maybe, once again, maybe you're not saved today. Maybe you don't know Jesus personally. You don't have a relationship. Uh, I would ask that you would make that right now. That you would come up and you would make that commitment and then I would also ask something else. So maybe you have accepted Jesus. Very possibly many of you have. Actually, I know most of you see many of you have. But maybe today might be the day where you make that extra commitment. You make the next commitment. You make that next calling in your life a reality. That you would make God a reality daily in your life. Not just an occasional thing, but something that would be past the day. It would be every day. All right, Carolyn's going to come up and we'll do more of the fun part, as I like to call it, and maybe a bit more lively. She's a bit more of a firecracker than I am. And so as we uh, kind of begin our presentation part, uh, you do have it on the screen there. Uh, I do apologize. We run a few minutes late, but we have these beautiful little cards with my smiling face. I'm sure you love that on the front. Uh, of these, and so those are in the back. So f uh, feel free. I just spoke too long. Feel free to pick that up on the way out. We'll have plenty. So if you want to put one on your fridge and you want to send one in, it does rip apart, but we'll get to that later. I do want to mention that before we get started. And now Carolyn's saying, You're taking too much time. Let's get this show I didn't say on that. the road. No, that's what her stare said. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and you can kind of, or I guess I'll introduce and then we'll go from there. Okay, she can do. Very good. All well, right. good morning, everybody. It's so good to see familiar faces, new faces, and it is so good to be in the house of the Lord, and especially here at Risen. Um, if you don't know us, uh, by chance, we are Justin and Carolyn Cook. We were blessed with two beautiful boys, Gabriel and Roland. Uh, they're downstairs. You'll see them later. They'll come up and start terrorizing everybody. Um, <laughs> but it was so good to see everybody this morning. We... Uh, like Justin said, if we can go to the next slide, please. We had just come back from four years in Saipan, and uh, just a few things uh, to talk about that. So, <coughs> man, 
<clears throat> maybe it's me too this morning. Um, we were working at the Saipan Community Church and also at the Saipan Community School. Justin, you were a teacher for the four years. Can you explain a little bit about subject? Sure. Um, before I really get into that, I just want to share that Carol and I come from this big metropolis in southeast Missouri called Bernie, about 2,000 people. So that's so big. Okay, maybe we don't call it a metropolis, but anyway, that's a pretty small place. Um, so as you met us, Carol and I, I had been in ministry since about uh, 2008 for myself, and then she joined me not too long after that, and then I was ordained in 2011 and we began preaching in the area and pastoring a few churches around this area. And when you had, most of you had met us, um, we had recently left the last church I was lead pastor at, and uh, things weren't so great at that point, and maybe I'll get into some of that later as we begin to share more of our story. But as Carolyn said, we did spend these uh, four years on this beautiful island called Saipan in the uh, Pacific Ocean, but the Philippine Sea, specifically, not too far actually from the Philippines where we're heading to. And so as you take a glance, and maybe you've seen Saipan Community Church or Saipan Community Schools page on Facebook, it is this beautiful island, it really is. Yet on that beautiful island, we found out very quickly there was a lot of sin. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of spiritual darkness, uh, current day witchcraft, okay? There's a lot of bad stuff there. Uh, even though it was beautiful in the pictures, that didn't show much of the story at all. And so as we began to find this out, our uh, desire to continue to work there became uh, more of a real thing. And eventually we had this opportunity to work with the Franklin Graham Evangelical Association, and they come to Saipan about nine months before uh, they have this one-day festival called Marianne's Festival of Hope in 2020. And we have the opportunity to do and work uh, with them as part of a large church effort on the island. Maybe Carol can share a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so we work not only just with the Frank Graham Society, but with all the churches on the island as well. And so for this event, it was a revival um, tight sense. It happened just right before COVID, so a great opportune time. Um, for the island and for the Marianas uh, Islands itself. Um, but we um, work together and help training um, with adults and also teenagers. And so with that training, uh, we helped these adults and teenagers become prayer counselors. So that means for this event, after Franklin Graham would do his message, it was a great opportunity for thousands and thousands of people to come up and to accept Jesus as their personal savior or to rededicate their lives to Jesus. And so because there are so many people, um, you know, we needed more hands on deck to help pray for those people as well. And, um, yeah, can you explain a little bit sure. more what you did? And I think we'll talk about this and we'll try to move on to our, our next point here. Uh, but during that time, we reached about 3,700 people total. And an island of about 40,000 people, that's a pretty big deal, right? So about 10% of the island was reached through the event not including the, the churches and pastors and leaders and volunteers. So probably 10% of the island is working or doing something here. And we saw about 500 first-time dedications and about 200 re rededications uh, during that one-day event. But about nine months of work prior to that, and we were glad to be a part of that. And I think it really challenges us to consider uh, together what it is God was leading us to do specifically. And which I think as we go on is a large part of our calling is not just God, where do I start? But God, how do I continue? Right. And so go ahead and, and move on to the next part here. Okay. Next slide, please. Next. So like Pastor Justin just said, going into our next calling, we, oh my gosh, we could have lived in Saipan even more than five years, I think. But we felt God's urgency to even go farther. And so with the Philippines, just a little bit more information that's up on the screen. Um, the Philippines consists of more than 7,641 islands and inlets. And as of 2019, the population it was more than 108 million people. So this you know, opportunity is astronomical with that. And also, um, specifically the last point, is, uh, we have the second largest island in the Philippines, which is Mindanao where the island is predominantly Roman Catholic and also has evidence of Islamic culture itself. And it is here in Mindanao where we specifically feel our calling, where we will be going to Davao City. Okay. Good. Um, so we do want to talk about that calling for a moment. As Carolyn mentioned, 
Uh, we love Saipan. Uh, when we felt God's calling to leave that place, it was not a simple thing. Uh, we had made home there. We felt restored there. But yeah, we knew God was leading us probably the whole time somewhere else. And so uh, I'm a teacher, and many of you probably knew that. And then over the course of the last four years, I finished my master's in Christian ministry and also finished my doctorate of ministry uh, while I was in Saipan online. And so with those tools and the experience prior, um, I'll be able to take part in working with General Bell's Bible College uh, as a professor there on campus in Davao City. Uh, which is our uh, church institution with General Baptist in the Philippines. And so they gave me this beautiful shirt when I was there a few weeks ago. Um, had, had tailors come in and make it for us. Uh, I can't explain to you how, how generous and hospitable the people of the Philippines simply are. Um, if you've ever met a Filipino or you know them, uh, they just tremendous people. I can't, I can't describe that. You know, we're in the middle of a conference day, and they they have a tailors come to campus as we're in the middle of conferences. Like, hey, come here real fast, and they measure us, and then they give us a shirt the next day. Just as it's just beyond, I, I can't. I think you just it. wanted a free shirt. I didn't want a free shirt, but it was it was incredible the way they provided it. Not just for me, the whole team got a free shirt. This isn't about me. But anyway, um, I'm so glad to just be there over the last few weeks. I've been back for about a week and understand maybe a bit more about what this calling is and what this is going to look like. And as Carolyn mentioned, our specific desire is to train young men and women to be able to effectively reach people with the gospel in the Philippines and also outside of the Philippines. And maybe we'll share a bit more about that in just a minute. And as Carolyn mentioned earlier, with these callings and giftings, we believe our specific callings and giftings align specifically with this assignment. So sometimes maybe you're like, as I mentioned earlier in the message, you're like, hey, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Begin with the things in your life that God has already placed there, the things that God is already leading you to. Maybe you're already doing some type of work for God's kingdom in your local church or uh, with a local uh, agency, right? So maybe you're already doing something. Continue to lean into that calling, God will continue to develop you in where and what he wants you to be. Okay, a little bit more here. All right, next slide, please. All right, so specifically going into Davos City, like Pastor Justin had talked previous, we'll be working with General Baptist Bible College, which is in Davos City, and a lot of people, if you know uh, Dr. Joyce Porcadilla Rubia, next slide, please. Uh, she is the current president of the college. And it is here that we'll be um, working and partnering with her through the college. Um, not only uh, Justin as a professor, but I'll be working personally with Dr. Dr. George Portadilla in the college and also along with their elementary and high school that lead up to college as well. I know recently they just got um, an opportunity to open up their kindergarten and preschool. So there is a great need um, to start in that age right now. So, yeah. Um, before we maybe before we go on to the next slide, just a moment uh, to, to consider that many of these students that are coming through uh, this bachelor level program, whether in theology or Christian education, many of them uh, will either serve in our churches there or will pastor our churches in the Philippines. And just to let you know, there are approximately 300 plus General Baptist churches in Davao City area alone, not including outside of Davao City, but just in that small area. And I say small, it's 1.2 million people, but just in that one contained place. And so there is an astronomical opportunity for these young men and women to not only just experience ministry, but to uh, grow in it and to be led by our church arm in the Philippines. And so our hope, once again, is for us to be able to partner with these young leaders and to help them as they transition in, into full-time ministry, as they transition into part-time ministry, whatever that looks like, for that specific assignment and to help guide them and lead them and maybe uh, to help them grow into what pos uh, position they may have in their churches, but also uh, as they partner with General Baptist Church of the Philippines, who will be overseeing them. Mm -hmm. And so that's our great hope is to assist in that effort. Right there. Uh, next slide, please. 
So as you see in the header, why send us? Why send us to the Philippines? What is a great need? So if you look on the screen, we have this shaded area in the yellow, which we are going to be talking about, which is the 1040 window. So if you do not know what the 1040 window is, it consists of North Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And as of right now, it is con or, uh, considered to be 3 billion unreached people in that area. And not only that, but it is this area alone that is 90 percent of Earth's inhabitants live in this area, which includes the Philippines. So, you know, this is a great opportunity to outspread the gospel, not only to the Philippines, but in this general area, as Pastor Justin said, with the graduates, we uh, tend to also um, uh, to impact a missional mindset that not only are they going to be um, pastoring churches, but having the opportunity to encourage others to create disciples to outspread even further than that. All right. Yeah. And, and as Carolyn said there, we like to term this mobilization of nationals. And so that term uh, to me uh, means that empowering Filipinos to reach Filipinos. And so you're like, well, why would you do that if you're spending all this time there? So this is why. Okay, so I could spend the next 30 years in the Philippines and yet not know their culture and understand it the way they do because they are Filipino. And so to be able to encourage them to reach their own people and spread it to other parts of the Philippines and do things that by myself I simply can't do and would be overly exhausting to even try. And so to try to create this mentality, I can reach my own people. I can reach parts of Southeast Asia. I can do this. Okay, so... This is a continuation uh, of not just our church arm in the States, but our church arms there and then also outside in the other countries and areas of Southeast Asia. And so I think that is probably one of the most important things um, that we want to get across is that the astronomical availability for people to go to other areas uh, is simply insane. Three billion unreached people. And that's just an estimation, maybe even more. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So one thing we definitely ask and as we wrap up is that above all else, we would love to have, first of all, your prayers. Because prayer as a Christian is our best tool. Not only do we get in touch with God, but we get in touch with God in the aspects of everything in our life. Like Pastor said um, earlier, daily, everything about it. And so we ask mostly that you pray for the Philippines. Please pray for the college. I know they started their uh, school year, I believe that was in September, and so they have already started this year. I know last year they had, there was a picture up there with Dr. Joyce Portilla, they had about like six or seven pastoral graduates, I believe. Uh, well, placements. Yeah. Placements, yep. Yeah. And so they, you know, could need the prayer of even extending that, you know, set, you said seven, 14 to 21 to even beyond so that we can create an impact to even go and further spread the gospel to uh, not only, like Pastor Justin says, the 300 plus churches, but out towards the 1040 window as we were talking about earlier. And not only that, for praying for the Philippines and for the college, please pray for our family. I know coming back, transitioning was a little different. Our youngest was born in Saipan, so he's had a wonderful time, and I think he'll experience exactly how cold it can be in Missouri. So, you know, pray for him. I know he's an, absolutely enjoyed it, and, um, but yeah, let's go on to the next slide. All right, so this comes down to our uh, share card that I mentioned to you earlier, and so if you're not familiar, many of you probably are, uh, General Baptist uses what we call a share card program, share uh, program, and so basically what happens is uh, one share is at $10 a month, and then we hope that that is a continued partnership um, every month. Our, our nice little card, as I mentioned earlier, is a tearaway, and so it will tear in the middle. If you want to, once again, put my beautiful face on your fridge, you can do that. Pray for us, um, and also pray for the Philippines. And then on the other side of the card, uh, we do have, if you want to make a commitment, if that's a monthly commitment, a one-time commitment, the card does make it very simple to do that. Um, and so just a graphic we like to use as if a family of three is eating a McDonald's meal together, especially if you're doing a value, you know, ride, burgers, fries, drink, all that stuff, you're looking at $10 a piece, about $30 for that family of three to eat one time at McDonald's. So that's three shares, okay? So uh, it is very doable. It's very possible for the share program to work. Uh, it might just take a little bit of effort. And so also something that's been asked frequently, and I have to make sure it's uh, mentioned, is that all the money that we raise goes directly in uh, to our 
uh, deputation, I'm getting my words here messed up, it goes directly to our deputation account, which in turn goes to funding us to get to the Philippines. And so General Baptist does not take a portion of that. They do not take a cut out of that. Everything goes directly towards our family's deputation. And so please do not worry that your money will be extracted and spent somewhere else if you send it in, but everything goes directly back to our deputation. And well, the last thing, which is on the screen there, is my family cannot fulfill this calling unless we have generous support from our uh, churches and our brothers and sisters stateside. And so that's simply the reality uh, of our mission, of our desire to go spread the gospel powerfully in the Philippines. Okay, and Carolyn will kind of wrap us up there. Exactly. All right, so first and foremost, we just, again, want to thank you for allowing us to come and worship with you and uh, spend time with you this morning in the house of the Lord. So please come and stop by our table. I know we've got a few little goodies, some free Filipino candy. We've got our share cards. Please come take one. If you do not want to, uh, you know, support, just please take one. And just like Justin said, please pray for our family and for the Philippines um, as the gospel is spread also. Um, yes, also, if you are interested in following our journey, please follow us. If you are into social media, we do have a page. It's called The Cook Family, Our Journey to Philippines. Not only is it our journey to the Philippines, but also we had, um, you know, pictures and information of our journey that we had just come back from the Saipan as well on there. So please, um, if you'd like to go into that. Also, if you're not on social media, which totally get it, we have an email and mailing list. So please stop by the table, put your name down, address, everything. Social Security, no, I'm just kidding. And uh, we will definitely. That is actually not General Babs approved. I don't know why she said that. Anyway, <laughs> we'll continue. We will definitely would love to get a hold of you guys. We would love to share, you know, our journey as we continue going to the Philippines. Of course, uh, we will do a monthly uh, letter, whether that be online as well. Um, as soon as we start um, our journey in the Philippines, when we get there, we will definitely send you guys a letter and all that. All right. So. And as uh, is in closing, uh, our efforts are locally, they are regionally, and around the world, and it takes all of us working together to fulfill those purposes. Thank you so much. <laughs>